Chapter Twelve of the Four Pools Mystery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Four Pools Mystery by Jean Webster. Chapter Twelve. I make a promise to Polly. The next few days were a nightmare to me. Even now I cannot think of that horrible period of suspense and doubt without a shudder. The coroner set to work immediately upon his preliminary investigation, and every bit of evidence that turned up only seemed to make the proof stronger against Radnor. It is strange how ready public opinion is to believe the worst of a man when he is down. No one appeared to doubt Rad's guilt and feeling ran high against him. Colonel Gaylord was a well-known character in the countryside, and in spite of his quick temper and rather imperious bearing, he had been a general favourite. At the news of his death, a wave of horror and indignation swept through the valley. Among the roughs in the village I heard not infrequent hints of lynching and even among the more conservative element, the general opinion seemed to be that lawful hanging was too honourable a death for the perpetrator of such brutal a crime. I have never been able to understand the quick and general belief in the boy's guilt, but I have always suspected that the sheriff did not do all in his power to quiet the feeling. It was to a large extent, however, the past reasserting itself. Though Radnor's record was not so black as it was painted, still it was not so white as it should have been. People shook their heads and repeated stories of how wild he had been as a boy, and how they had always foreseen some such end as this. Reports of the quarrels with his father were told and retold, until they were magnified beyond all recognition. The old scandals about Jeff were revived again, and the general opinion seemed to be that the Gaylord boys were degenerates through and through. Rad's personal friends stood by him staunchly, but they formed a pitifully small minority compared to the general sensation-seeking public. I visited Radnor in the Kennisburg jail on the morning of my uncle's funeral, and found him quite broken in spirit. He had had time to think over the past, and with his father lying dead at Four Pools, it had not been pleasant thinking. Now that it was too late, he seemed filled with remorse over his conduct toward the old man, and he dwelt continually on the fact of his having been unwilling to make up the quarrel of the night before the murder. In this mood of contrition he mercilessly accused himself of things I am sure he had never done. I knew that the jailer was listening to every word outside, and I became unspeakably nervous for fear he would say something which could be twisted into an incriminating confession. He did not seem to comprehend in the least the danger of his own position. He was entirely taken up with the horror of his father's death. As I was leaving, however, he suddenly grasped my hand with tears in his eyes. Tell me, Arnold, do people really believe me guilty? I knew by people he meant Polly Mathers but I had not had an opportunity to speak with her alone since the day of the tragedy. I haven't talked to anyone but the sheriff, I returned. Madison would be glad enough to prove it, Radnor said bitterly, and he turned his back and stood staring through the iron bars of the window, while I went out and the jailer closed the door and locked it. All through the funeral that afternoon I could scarcely keep my eyes from Polly Mather's face. She appeared so changed since the day of the picnic that I should scarcely have known her for the same person. 
it seemed incredible that three days could make such a difference in a bright, healthy, vigorous girl. All her youthful vivacity was gone. She was pale and spiritless, with deep rings beneath her eyes, and the lids red with crying. After the services were over, I approached her a moment, as she stood in her black dress aloof from the others at the edge of the little family burying ground. She greeted me with a tremulous smile, and then, as her glance wandered back to the pile of earth that two men were already shoveling into the grave, her eyes quickly filled with tears. "'I loved him as much as if he were my own father,' she cried, "'and it's my fault that he's dead. I made him go.' "'No, Polly, it is not your fault,' I said decisively. It was a thing which no one could foresee, and no one could help. She waited a moment, trying to steady her voice. Then she looked up pleadingly in my face. Radnor is innocent. Tell me you believe it. I am sure he is innocent, I replied. Then you can clear him. You're a lawyer. I know you can clear him. You may trust me to do my best, Polly. I hate Jim Madison, she exclaimed with a flash of her old fire. He swears that Rad is guilty, and that he will prove him so. Rad may have done some bad things, but he's a good man, better than Jim Madison ever thought of being. Polly, I said, with a touch of bitterness, I wish you might have realized that truth earlier. Rad is at heart as splendid a chap as ever lived, and his friends ought never to have allowed him to go astray. She looked away without answering, and then in a moment turned back to me and held out her hand. "'Good-bye. When you see him again, please tell him what I said.' As she turned away, I looked after her, puzzled. I was sure at last that she was in love with Radnor, and I was equally sure that he did not know it, for in spite of his sorrow at his father's death, and of the suspicion that rested on him, I knew that he would not have been so completely crushed had he felt that she was with him. Why must this come to him now too late to do him any good, when he had needed it so much before? I felt momentarily enraged at Polly. It seemed somehow as if the trouble might have been avoided had she been more straightforward. Then at the memory of her pale face and pleading eyes I relented. However thoughtless she had been before, she was changed now. This tragedy had somehow made a woman of her overnight. When Radnor came at last to claim her, they would each, perhaps, be worthier of the other. I returned to the empty house that night and sat down to look the facts squarely in the face. I had hitherto been so occupied with the necessary preparations for the funeral, and with instituting a search for Cat Eye Mose, that I had scarcely had time to think, let alone map out any logical plan of action. Radnor was so stunned by the blow that he could barely talk coherently, and as yet I had had no satisfactory interview with him. Immediately after the Colonel's death, I had very hastily run over his private papers, but had found little to suggest a clue. Among some old letters were several from Nanny's husband, written at the time of her sickness and death. Their tone was bitter. Could the man have accomplished a tardy revenge for past insults? I asked myself, but investigation showed this theory to be most untenable. He was still living in the little Kansas village where she had died, had married again, and become a peaceful, plodding citizen. It required all his present energy to support his wife and children. I dare say the brief episode of his first marriage had almost faded from his mind. There was not the slightest chance that he could be implicated. I sifted the papers again, thoroughly and painstakingly, but found nothing that would throw any light upon the mystery. 
While I was still engaged with this task, a message came from the coroner, saying that the formal inquest would begin at ten o'clock the next morning in the Kennisburg courthouse. This gave me no chance to plan any sort of campaign, and I could do little more than let matters take their course. I hoped, however, that in the progress of the inquest some clue would be brought to light which would render Radnor's being remanded for trial impossible. So far, I had to acknowledge, the evidence against him appeared overwhelming. A motive was supplied in the fact that the colonel's death would leave him his own master and a rich man. The well-known fact of their frequent quarrels, coupled with Radnor's fierce temper and somewhat revengeful disposition, was a very strong point in his disfavour. Added to this, the suspicious circumstances of the day of the tragedy, the fact that he was not with the rest of the party when the crime must have been committed, the alleged print of his boots, and the finding of the matchbox, his subsequent perturbed condition, everything pointed to him as the author of the crime. It was a most convincing chain of circumstantial evidence. Considering the data that had come to light, there seemed to be only one alternative, and that was that Cat Eye Mose had committed the murder. I clung tenaciously to this belief, but I found, in the absence of any further proof or any conceivable motive, that few people shared it with me. The marks of his bare feet proved conclusively that he had been, in whatever capacity, an active participator in the struggle. He was there to aid his master, the sheriff affirmed, and being a witness to the crime, it was necessary to put him out of the way. Why hide the body of one and not the other? I asked. To throw suspicion on Mose. This was the universal opinion. No one from the beginning would listen to a word against Mose. In his case, as well as in Radnor's, the past was speaking. Through all his life, they said, he had faithfully loved and served the colonel, and if necessity required, he would willingly have died for him. But for myself, I continued to believe in the face of all opposition that Mose was guilty. It was more a matter of feeling with me than of reasoning. I had always been suspicious of the fellow. A man with eyes like that was capable of anything. The objection which the sheriff raised that Colonel Gaylord was both larger and stronger than Mose, and could easily have overcome him, proved nothing to my mind. Mose was a small man, but he was long-armed and wiry, doubtless far stronger than he looked. Besides, he had been armed, and the nature of his weapon was clear. The floor of the cave was drawn with scores of broken stalactites. Nothing could have made a more formidable weapon than one of these long pieces of jagged stone used as a club. As to the motive for the crime, who could tell what went on in the slow workings of his mind? The colonel had struck him more than once, unjustly, I did not doubt, and though he seemed at the moment to take it meekly, might he not have been merely biding his time? His final revenge may have been the outcome of many hoarded grievances that no one knew existed. The fellow was more than half insane, what more likely than that he had attacked his master in a fit of animal passion, and then, terrified at the result, escaped to the woods. That seemed to me the only plausible explanation. No facts had come out concerning the hunt or the robbery, and I do not think that either was connected in the public mind with the murder. But to my mind the death of Colonel Gaylord was but the climax of the long series of events which commenced on the night of my arrival with the slight and ludicrous episode of the stolen roast chicken. 
I had been convinced at the time that Mose was at the bottom of it, and I was convinced now that he was also at the bottom of the robbery and the murder. How Radnor had got drawn into the muddle of the hand, I could not fathom, but I suspected that Mose had hoodwinked him, as he had the rest of us. Assuming that my theory was right, then Mose was hiding, and all my energies from the beginning had been bent toward his discovery. The low range of mountains which lay between Four Pools Plantation and the Luray Valley was covered thickly with woods and very sparsely settled. Mose knew every foot of the ground. He had wandered over these mountains for days at a time, and must have been familiar with many hiding places. It was in this region that I hoped to find him. Immediately after the Colonel's death, I had offered a large reward either for Moses' capture or for any information regarding his whereabouts. His description had been telegraphed all up and down the valley, and every farmer was on the alert. Bands of men had been formed, and the woods scoured for him, but as yet without result. I was hourly expecting, however, that some clue would come to light. The sheriff, on the other hand, in persuasion of this theory that Mose had been murdered, had been no less indefatigable in his search for the body. The river had been dragged, the cave and surrounding woods searched, but nothing had been found. Mose had simply vanished from the earth and left no trace. To my disappointment the morning still brought no news. I had hoped to have something definite before the inquest opened. I rode into Kennisburg early in order to hold a conference with Radnor, and get from him the facts in regard to his own and Moses' connection with the hand. My former passivity in the matter struck me now as almost criminal. Perhaps had I insisted in probing it to the bottom, my uncle might have been living still. I entered Radnor's cell determined not to leave it until I knew the truth. But I met with an unexpected obstacle. He refused absolutely to discuss the question. Radnor, I cried at last, are you trying to shield anyone? Do you know who killed your father? I know no more about who killed my father than you do. Do you know about the hand? Yes, he said desperately. I do, but it is not connected with either the robbery or the murder, and I cannot talk about it. I argued and pleaded, but to no effect. He sat on his cot, his head in his hands, staring at the floor. Stubbornly refusing to open his lips, I gave over pleading and stormed. It's no use, Arnold, he said finally. I won't tell you anything about the hand. It doesn't enter into the case. I sat down again and patiently outlined my theory in regard to Mose. It is impossible, he declared. I have known Mose all my life, and I have never yet known him to betray a trust. He loved my father as much as I did, and if my life defended on it, I should swear that he was faithful. Rad, I beseeched, I am not only your attorney, I am your friend. Whatever you say to me is as if it had never been said. I must know the truth. He shook his head. I have nothing to say. You have got to have something to say, I cried. You have got to go on the stand and make an absolutely open and straightforward statement of everything bearing on the case. You have got to appear anxious to find and punish the man who murdered your father. You have got to gain public sympathy, and before you go on the stand, you owe it to yourself and me to leave nothing unexplained between us. He raised his eyes miserably to mine. Must I go on? he asked. Can't I refuse to testify? I don't see that they can punish me for contempt of court. I'm already in prison. They can hang you, said I bluntly. He buried his face in his hands with a groan. 
Arnold, he pleaded. Don't make me face all those people. You can see what a state my nerves are in. I haven't slept for three nights. He held out his hand to show me how it trembled. I can't talk. I don't know what I'm saying. You don't know what you're urging me to do. My anger at his stubbornness vanished in a sudden spasm of pity. The poor fellow was scarcely more than a boy, though I was completely in the dark as to what he was holding back and why he was doing it. Yet I felt instinctively that his motives were honourable. Rad, I said, it would help your cause to be open with me, and if you were remanded for trial before the grand jury, you must in the end tell me everything. But now I will not insist. Probably nothing will come up about the hand. I can, of course, refuse to let you speak on the ground of incriminating evidence, but that is the last stand I wish to take. We must gain public opinion on our side, and to that end you must testify yourself. You must force every person present to believe that you are incapable of telling a falsehood. I believe that already, and so does Polly Mathers. Radnor's face flushed, and a quick light sprung into his eyes. What do you mean? I repeated what Polly had said, and I added my own interpretation. The effect was electrical. He straightened his shoulders with an air of trying to throw off his despondency. I'll do my best, he promised. Heaven knows I'd like to know the truth as well as you. This doubt is simply hell. A knock sounded on the door, and the sheriff's officer informed us that the hearing was about to begin. You haven't explained your actions on the day of the murder, I said hurriedly. I must have a reason. That's all right. It will come out. If you just keep them off the hand, I'll clear everything else. If you do that, said I, immeasurably relieved, there'll be no danger of your being held for trial. I rose and held out my hand. Courage, my boy. Remember that you are going to prove your innocence not only for your own, but for Polly's sake. End of chapter 12